take you back in history and bring you to the Anand plan. There was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission set up. And the reason I call this a Truth Commission is because I think, and I th and believe Niazi agrees, the truth is the foundation of reconciliation. So we really have to get our act going. And of course, this is much wider. Uh, one thing I've seen talking about the Truth Commission is that it operates on at least two levels. The first level is a personal. Whoever hears the expression truth commission and does not have an exact understanding of what we're trying to do, takes off in his own mind or her own mind and discusses issues that concern him about truth. And that is very healthy because within that person's head, the issue of truth becomes processed. And I think that's a bigger uh, success than actually setting this up. People are thinking along the lines of truth. And then the next level is whether we can get this um, commission off the ground. So I'll turn it to you because this is mostly about you and not us. Um, it's, uh, yes, I see a hand at the end. I can't see the person. So uh, we'll do, just to be democratic, we'll take, I'll, I'll give one question and then Niazi gives the next one and then we follow uh, irrespective. Please state your name if you can. And I also like to acknowledge Nicolas Kiriagidis, uh, who is here with us. He's one of the organizers. So a round of applause for Nicolas um, for, for supporting truth and inviting us here today. So please. Yeah, you need to do it so it's uh, broadcast. Good morning again. My name is Andreja Jandreu. Thank you for the discussion. I have a question. As you very well stated, uh, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is not the first time that appears. We can see it uh, through history. That, uh, you know. So could you maybe put it in context and explain to us if in the past uh, similar commissions have actually changed something or if they worked, um, they had advantages or disadvantages or how it can be applied to uh, the Cyprus uh, reality and why we actually need it today more than ever. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, there's an organization called Transitional Justice. It's based in New York. Its job is to do this kind of thing. I won't go through that, but I'll tell you there are at least 40 truth commissions all over the world. And the purpose of the truth commission is to engage in the process of truth finding. And that soul searching exercises, exercise brings out a lot of things in a society that is essentially traumatized and it's in the process of healing. And transitional justice in law is a healing mechanism for societies who have experienced conflict and want to rebuild it. You are not building a solid foundation if truth is not included. You'll get it wrong. Um, South Africa, you have seen it, is perhaps the most important. Um, Colombia was very important. I mean, the process, the peace process was there. It started, it failed, it started again. There is a methodology, so uh, I don't think the question is, should we have a truth commission in Cyprus? I think the question is, when we will have a truth commission in Cyprus? Yes, I would like to say a few words to this. Uh, first of all, yeah, you mentioned the uh, South African experience, which is most, most uh, well known. Don't forget that in South Africa, the perpetrators, they had to apologize in front of their victims to stand and accept and acknowledge their own deeds to be victims, and only then we got the amnesty. It was not like, I'm sorry what's happened in the past, I'm sorry it's not good enough. It's exactly there to, 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 to stand in front of the victims and acknowledge what you did. So in that sense, it was a very successful one. It helped quite a lot in reconciliation. Well, there are other examples. For example, in Chile we have another example which works Partly, uh, what's happened to crimes about the crimes in Pinochet period, but you see nowadays in, uh, in Chile half of the population are with Pinochet. So, we, so here this reconciliation didn't work well actually, although some truth has been raised. So uh, there are different models of commissions of so truth and reconciliation and how they work. And I think each country, I mean, there is something in Italy, in Spain, there is a lot of debate nowadays. So we have to look in our case what is best. You have to appoint the next question, so it's your turn. You have to pick someone no, from the audience. There's someone here. Good. Thank you. I go by you.
Thank you. Uh, my name is Petros Aristodimou. I'm an ophthalmologist in Limassol. Um, as a Greek Cypriot, I've inherited trauma and I've inherited guilt. So the Tooth Commission will also apply to me as well as, you know, my previous generation. I was born in 77, so, you know, not directly into that. But there's an important point um, between coming up with the truth and reconciliation. We should have healing. We should have restorative justice. So we should put a lot of effort in um, developing mechanisms and um, I am asking people who are real ex experts in this because that's actually the most important part of this process to apply effective healing and restorative mechanisms. Okay, to this directly, I mean, yes, healing. Healing can be only achieved if you have an empathy towards the stories of others. The language of healing language of the wounds is only if you consider also the other, if you go into his or her shoes and do you develop an empathy. That thing in Cyprus doesn't work at all because nation ethnocentric narratives about the past justifies each community all the time. And this is done by press level, informal education, education, political elites. So and this all those are close. There are of course people like us, we are trying to do this. Of course, but this is not good enough. Uh, healing, the language of healing cannot start by saying to the other, all is your fault. So we have to develop a new language of healing parallel to all of our search here. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take healing as well, and I'll take you to a graveyard, and you can see the tombstones, and you can see the cypress trees, and you can't make the difference from afar if it's Muslim or Christian. You'll have to make sure that you go on a Friday or on a Saturday, depending on which faith you follow. So yeah, there is healing. A tombstone is closure, and this is the kind of thing we want. But acknowledgement, as Niazi says, I think it's the next step. So I get to pick another question. And, and we have four minutes. Yes, uh, uh, I follow up your uh, question, when uh, it was the question. So, uh, according to these 40 uh, commissions, uh, have they been established after a solution or before a solution? Yeah, I always get this question. Uh, don't rock the boat is essentially your question. Well, I'm not saying... No, no, Matthew, I'm, I'm reading it. Uh, so, don't rock the boat is the question. The answer is the boat is sinking. So I'll, I'll give you that. Um, yes, most of, uh, not most, a, a number of them have started after the process has ended, but I think 50 years or 60 years to be exact um, of a frozen conflict, I think is enough time, primarily because of death. Death really is the cutoff point. Most of the parents have gone, if not all. A number of the spouses, because it's mostly men that are miss missing, a number of the wives uh, have gone, or partners. Children are around, um, but do you want to be a Spain example? Three generations later, after the Spanish Civil War, uh, someone comes and tells you, ah, you had a grandfather or a great-grandfather, here's a little box, he fought. Uh, for the Democrats and he's in the Valley of the Disappeared and you can now have the remains and you can bury them. That is why you hear a sense of urgency in my talk because I feel that and I feel that too much time has been given. Um, and I don't buy the argument that the peace process hasn't completed because I believe that a truth commission is a building block of the, th to, of the peace process. So you need building blocks to build uh, the peace house. Yazi. Yes, I think you wanted a question. Yeah. Is the last one? Okay. Yeah, uh, is, are we, we've got, we have two minutes. Please. Sorry, this is how life goes. <laughs> yes. My name is Lena and I wanted to ask about something you mentioned that everyone wants it, but it's a matter of how much we want it. I find it hard to believe that everyone wants it, given the fact that on both sides the leadership and the educational systems have used the past to instrumentalize it. So I want to ask, is it just a matter of political and social will, or is it also, are there actors who are actively stopping it or don't want this to happen? Thanks, I'll give you a cynical um, a reply. So yeah, very, very, uh, very good question. A number of people who are against it in the sense that they are using the other community as the pretext for not proceeding are in fact the ones 
who were involved in the atrocity themselves. And they're using this in order to cover up what has been done. Uh, there are people, the system is there, but we really have to do something about this. I mean, identifying the issue, as you very rightly have done, um, is not good enough for me now. I want to deal with it. And again, because of the urgency, I want to manage it and I want to overcome the problem. And this kind of uh, discussion, I think, is very helpful uh, if we have managed to convince you that this is important. And it happened everywhere else in the world. Why is Cyprus so different? Is it? Yes. Uh, well, we definitely we need a, a policy of remembrance, a policy of memory to replace the ruling ethnocentric policy of remembering. This is so essential. Now, how do we remember nowadays? On both sides, you got the slogans, thanks, Sekhno, Unut Mam, I don't forget, and we insist not to forget. But actually, what do we remember? That's the question. And what do we remember definitely is selective elements of recent history to justify a political position, ethnic political position. So we have to replace this by exchanging of memory and creating a new policy of remembrance. There we are. This is the challenge. It's a great challenge because not many are interested in this kind of uh, empathy work or memory policies. If, if I may add remembrance and honoring, we need to honor these people. These people are, at least for the missing, they seem to be in a sort of different category of every, from everyone else. We remember, we honor, and we give truth a chance. Thank you very much. Thank you.